I love Nintendo games. They always have this really fun and high quality standard that I honestly really enjoy throughout the years. Whether it's playing through the high adventures of Zelda, or the weird experimental games that become huge series like Pikmin or Splatoon. There's just something really fun of playing through a simple Nintendo game. So when I was growing up, my first ever experience with Nintendo was at the near end of the GameCube's life and at the start of the Wii's life, with the Wii being the primary console I mostly played on. There was a bunch of variety of games out there like Wii Sports and Mario Party 8 and such, but since I had a Nintendo Wii, they also had the Virtual Console and that was how I experienced a lot of the older Nintendo games even beyond the GameCube. But there was one that stuck out to me when playing through it, which was Super Mario 64. Now growing up I had two cousins that had an Xbox 360 and PS3 and they mostly played more mature games like Call of Duty for example, but there was something in Mario 64 that grabbed me compared to the games that they played. There was just something very lighthearted and charming about it. And even to this day, as there's been so many games on the Nintendo Switch over the years, I always try to boot up Mario 64 and replay it a lot. Especially when 3D All-Stars released, where I was able to play three of my favorite games of all time on one console. And not trying to say like, oh, these new games aren't as good as the old ones, because there's so many games on the Switch that are new and original that I really enjoy. Pikmin 4 and Tears of the Kingdom are tied in neck as one of my favorite games of this year, and Super Mario Bros. Wonder looks like it's going to be the best 2D Mario game since Super Mario World on the SNES. But since this week is my birthday and I'm going to be turning 21 this year, I thought why not it'd be fun just to talk about my favorite Nintendo game of all time, period. And also, probably one of the most important Nintendo games ever made, period. As Super Mario 64 was the first ever 3D platforming Mario game ever made, and it's also one of the most talked about Nintendo games of all time, period. Even to this day, people will talk about this game. Whether it's the crazy ROM hacks, or the crazy mods people do in other games. There's just something very timeless about Mario 64 that honestly is very appealing, even to this very day. Yo, listen up! We will not live in a two-dimensional world! We won't go in one direction, or see where we can set. We will walk through walls. We will take a look around us. We will not be confined. We believe in the path of least limits. We won't be told how to view the world. We will experience true freedom. We will not compromise. We will live the game through our hands. We will be in control of something. Change. 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 We will change the but, with everything out of the way, let's get started. So when you start the game, it shows the iconic Mario floating head, where it shows you that this game is all 3D now. It has cute little animations where it's playing around with two stars and such, and then it shows a little demo, which the first one always being the one where he fights Bowser, which is honestly how I first saw Bowser, ever. And I'll be honest, at first he kind of terrified me because this giant green monster is just walking slowly at you. You can also mess with Mario's face around, which is always a fun thing to do. But anyway, so we choose a save slot, and it shows the iconic opening where Peach asks Mario to come to the castle because she baked a cake for him. And we get that iconic pan opening of the entire castle, and it shows Mario coming out of the warp pipe. But anyway, so we're at the front area of Peach's castle. There's really not that much to talk about of this area. There is a secret cannon you can go through, but it's currently blocked right now. But yeah, it's just a simple area where you can just breathe and enjoy the new control scheme. Once you go inside, you greet it with an ominous message from Bowser saying that there was no one in the castle. It was then revealed that Bowser has infiltrated the castle and locked everyone up inside the walls of the castle. Not only that, but also Bowser stole all the power stars. So Mario needs to find all the power stars and stop Bowser's scheme. How Mario finds the power stars? Well, throughout the castle, he'll find these mysterious paintings that he can jump into to transport into different worlds. But before we talk about those worlds, I think it's appropriate to talk about the controls in Mario 64. So in the jump of 3D, Mario became a lot more acrobatic. Mario can use his usual jump, but he can also do a special triple jump where if he jumps three times in a row, he jumps a lot higher. He can also do this special wall jump where if you jump onto a wall at a certain time, he can bounce off of it, making some really satisfying platforming. Mario can also do a simple punch move that's honestly not really that effective. He can also do this weird ground kick move. I do not know what he does. It just kind of makes him look like he's doing a break dance or something. Mario can also do a special long jump, which is something you're going to be doing, which makes him... You know the point. The controls for Mario 64, the best way I can describe it, is that it's easy to do, but it's very interesting to master. 
Especially when you're trying to combine the triple jump with the wall jump and the dive, you can get through serious areas with ease like this. Like for example, in Big Boo's Haunt, when you first start the area, the second floor is off limits until you get all the boos. But with a simple platform ring, you can get to the area with ease. This is what makes Mario 64 very timeless. The controls may be slightly jank, but the movement and everything and what you can do with it has so much potential. You can use these areas to get to so much high ground that it's very fun to speedrun, which is why Mario 64 is always popular in the speedrunning community. It's because the controls are very simple but extremely effective. That's why a lot of ROM hacks decide to take Mario's control to its fullest potential a lot of times. But anyway, so here's how the level design is played out. You have three major hub areas to explore, which is the first floor of the castle, the basement, and then the second and third floors for last. You're going to need a certain amount of power stars to open certain doors. And this is where the paintings come in. You jump into a painting and explore the areas to get the star. All the levels have about 6 stars in each of them, with an additional 100 coin star if you get all 100 coins. The game contains about 15 main levels, with a bunch of secret mini-levels throughout the castle. Now even though 15 levels doesn't sound that much, the levels themselves are extremely huge. That's mostly because during the time, they couldn't really make linear 3D levels that easily with the N64 cartridge, so instead of a bunch of levels, they decided to have fewer levels, but they are big and open. Another thing that's different from the linear games is that Mario's health system is completely different, as it's much more of a traditional health point, instead of the health point being represented by Mario's shape. Another thing that's returning from the 2D Mario games are power-ups, but unlike those games, Mario doesn't have the Fire Flower, Cape Feather, or Tanuki suit. This time he has special hats that he can equip. The first one, and arguably the most recognizable one, is the Cape Feather, where Mario spreads wings on his head where he can fly. The controls in these can be a bit funky because it's all about momentum and how Mario glides, and it's heavily encouraged to use a lot of the cannons to really use the wing cap. The Vanish Cap turns Mario transparent somewhat, and he's able to go through certain walls. There is really not that much to talk about for this power-up, it's pretty much self-explanatory. And the last one is the Metal Cap, where it turns into everyone's favorite Mario Kart character, Metal Mario. He's pretty much a heavier version of Mario, where he can sink underwater and get a lot of coins easily. He's also completely invincible and able to get through the poison gas in certain levels. The power-ups they have is pretty simple, but they are pretty effective when you're trying to get through certain areas with the most interesting part with them where you can actually combine the Vanish Cap with the Metal Cap to get to a certain star. These power-ups are pretty simple, but they're very useful, especially when you're trying to go through the 15 levels, and I think it's time for us to talk about them. The first level, and probably the most iconic level in every Mario game, is bob -Bom Battlefield. Now, usually when you start a Mario game, you always have the grassy fields where it's just like a simple plains, but in this one, it's a freaking battlefield, where it's a war between the good and bad bob -Boms with the pink ones being the allies, and these will be characters you'll be seeing throughout the levels. The area is pretty open with a bunch of cannons you can jump into and shoot out of the air. They even have a giant chain chop guarding a certain star for Bowser. And of course, we have the ever so iconic mountain that holds the home to King bob -Bomb. He He's the first boss fight you'll be going through the game, and he's pretty simple. All you have to do is just grab him by the back, throw him a few times, and he goes down. Once you do, you'll get booted out of the level where you can replay the level, trying to find different obstacles to get through. One of them being, if you choose a certain one, is Koopa the Quick, who is a giant Koopa that will challenge you for a race. And of course, there's other challenges you can do that you'll be seeing in a lot of the levels, like the red coins for example, where there's red coins scattered throughout the level, and you need to gather them all of them to get a star. Honestly, a really first really good level that really emphasizes what you'll be going to be doing in Mario 64. The second one we have here is Bump Fortress. Another very recognizable level in Mario 64, in fact, this level was remade in Mario Galaxy 2. This level you're playing through an area where you have to climb up this fortress area to get to King Thwomp. And this is where I need to mention something. When it comes to issues with Mario 64, one of the main ones people have is that every time you get a start, you get booted out of the screen. And I feel like Thwomp Fortress is guilty about this the most because two of the stars is literally climbing up the tower. But on a personal level, I don't really mind this too much because the levels are very open, you're able to get back to certain areas instantly. 
However, there are certain stars where making backtracking through levels can be a hassle, so maybe the boot-out screen isn't that bad. But besides that, I think Front Fortress is another solid one. There's a lot of great nook and crannies you can find secrets and such, and it's honestly really fun just to race up the mountain as fast as you can. Jolly Watcher Bay is one of the three water levels in this game, and honestly, for the first ever water level in this game, it's honestly pretty solid. I really enjoy the atmosphere this course has. The music has this atmospheric aura that makes you feel like you're very free to roam around. And of course, I have to mention the iconic giant eel, which honestly is terrifying, but not the scariest thing I've seen in this game. There was actually one thing that actually scared me, and it's not the one you would expect. Honestly, the first area with the eel, it's honestly confusing how to lure it out. Um, it took me a while to realize that I think you need to go up the water once you go near it. I don't know, I have, I've been playing this game for so long, I still don't understand how it works. The only other issue I have with this area is the um, 100 coin mission, because coins in this one and the other water level is honestly really scarce. You really need to look for coins in this level, and it's honestly kind of stressful, but honestly a decent challenge. Cool Cool Mountain is honestly one of my favorite levels in this game. You're sliding down the mountain, trying to get all the stars as you can, and doing special races and such. Although, when I was younger, I had a hard time doing the race because sometimes I just keep falling off and such. And speaking of falling off, one of my favorite missions in this course is to retrieve the baby penguin to its mother. Mostly because it demonstrates the strength of Mario 64, where it usually asks you to go all the way down the mountain the usual way, but you could just do a simple jump and you're down there immediately. And one of the funniest little easter eggs is that if you 100% Mario 64 and return to the big house with the big penguin, he gets a lot thicker. And okay, okay, let's get this over with. Big Boost Haunt is another fantastic course in this game. It's the usual haunted house level for a Mario game, but what's different for this one is that it has a much more of a sinister atmosphere. Because everything just feels a lot more spooky, especially when you try to defeat the ooze in the first area, where it just claims, Ghosts don't die, ghosts don't die, and you have a surprisingly unnerving Mario level. Especially with that merry-go-round theme, it's honestly very weird. And that's just talking about the areas you can get to the first floor, but when we get to the basement, this is when the levels get a lot more interesting. Hazy Maze Cave is a love it or hate it kind of level. You either really like it or don't like it for its aimless level design. Personally, I really enjoy this level, even if the 100 coin star mission can be a bit of a hassle in this one as well. How you enter it is also pretty weird because it's just like this metal pool thing that you just enter. You also go down the same metal pool thing as well once you get to the metal cap section. The only thing that gave me trouble playing through this is probably just the Toxic Maze section of the level. Mostly because there's two stars you need to find in these areas, and sometimes I have a hard time because, like, they're literally next to each other, I just realized, but even then it was just a bit of a hassle. And of course I need to give a big shout out to Dory. Lethal Lava Land is honestly one of the best levels in this entire game. But before we do so, I think I should mention something about this level. Sometimes you hear a lot of people say that there are certain moments in Mario 64 that terrifies them, like the Mad Piano for example. But what really scared me when I was little was the painting for Lethal Lava Land. I mean, come on, look at this! Look at the dark evil eyes it has! Like, it's a fiery background and everything, this honestly terrified me when I was little. Why, for the love of Christ, no one talks about this? But besides that, I feel like Lethal Robber Plan is a good example of why people like Mario 64. There's a set path you can go through to get through areas in Lethal Lava Land, or you can do a little bit of a risk and reward and just have Mario jump into the lava and get to areas quicker. Everything just feels very condensed, like every single part of this area has a thing to do so. And when I was young, I felt like a freaking genius when I realized that there is a secret passage in the volcano that leads to two different stars. This course also has one of my favorite Mario villains, the Bullies. I just like how there's a different strategy of how to take these guys down instead of just using a simple punch and jump. Basically all you have to do is just punch them into lava. While they are pretty simple, I think I really like them because of their designs. They're just really cool. 
Um, I do enjoy their 3D world counterpart a bit more. The only thing I kind of wish they didn't change was the color scheme, because I feel like they looked a bit cooler with the black color scheme. Although I do like how the horns are now, where it's a lot more bull-like. But of course, with every other Mario game, there always has to be that damn desert level. However, to give Shifting Sandland some credit, it's honestly a really cool execution of a desert level. I've just never been a big fan of desert themes. I always felt they were boring. But to give this area a lot more credit, it is like Link to Lava Land where everything is just so small and condensed. However, getting through area to area is slightly more tricky because unlike Lethal Lava Land where fire will just damage you, Mario will die instantly if he falls into the quicksand. But besides that hazard, you can really go as much as you can if you know what you're doing, especially like with the wing cap power up. The only star that gave me a bit of a hassle is the 100 coin star because there's two segments in this area, which is the outside and the pyramid. And this applies to both Lethal Lava Land and a later one, where there are certain areas where if you don't have a certain amount of coins, you're out of the 100 coin mission. But the easiest highlight of this level is probably the boss fight, because it's honestly the coolest one in my opinion. Basically, after solving a puzzle of ground pounding the four pillars, the top of the pyramid will collapse, meaning there'll be a secret passage. Here you'll be fighting Irock, this mysterious stone monster where you have to hit the weak spot. I honestly like it because how much of a surprise he is, because you just go down this weird area, climb up these stairs, and then suddenly the stairs comes to life. Was there a few levels that were a bit of a sour spot for me? Well, I do have only one. I thought Jolly Roger Bay was a decent water level per se, but for its other water level, I cannot say the same. For one, I have to say, this is probably the most unique level in the game because it actually is coincided with the boss fight in this area. And in order to get to the second boss fight, you're gonna need to clear the first level in this course. Where basically you need to get on top of this submarine, which honestly kind of implies how you get to the lava area of the second boss world. After you do so, the submarine is gone and it replaced by these pull areas where you can get through the higher areas. Honestly, this area is not too shabby, I just feel a bit bitter towards it because it's honestly the hardest with the 100 coin star mission. Because I swear to god, that out of all the levels in this game, this one felt the most scarce when it comes to finding coins. But I like how compact this area is with the stars, so I can't be too harsh with it. I still think this is the weakest level of the game, but it's not the bad one. I think my only critique with this one truly is, is that some of the star missions felt too similar to the one from Jolly Roger Bay. Stuff like finding the right orders to open the chest and swimming through this current area. And it also introduces the only time where you can actually combine two of the caps into one. Although to be honest, I feel like you can only do it for once. Because I cannot think of anything else you can use when you're combining the metal and the invisible one besides this. Maybe to get through the poison, but that's pretty much redundant. Oh yeah, this level's also pretty slow. But anyway, so once you get all the stars from the basement, it's time to go up to the second area of the floors, and we start off with Snowman's Land. Honestly, a really strong contender as one of my favorite levels in this game. I honestly love snow-themed worlds in Mario games. Even with the most bland Mario games like New Super Mario Bros. 2 for something, I really love how the snow worlds look. And this one is pretty good. The main centerpiece of this area is a giant snowman. There is a bunch of variety of things you can do to get a star, like going through this icy maze, for example. This level also has the only time a bully has a different variation where it's made of ice. The only reason why I kind of have to knock down points for this area is probably with the spin drifts area. Mostly because, in order to get through this area, you need to jump onto the spin drifts. There is no other way to do it unless you're skilled speedrunner. Which kind of makes me uneasy every time I do a little platforming area here, because that area is the only way to get a Koopa Shell, which is how you get the red coins, or the 100 coin star mission. But besides that, this is a really good level. I really like it. The next one we have here is Wet Dry World, and honestly, it's a bit of a weird one. It's honestly the best water level in the game, because it has a really fascinating level design and everything. Instead of located in a cove, you're located in an abandoned city. Which, you can lower or raise the water level to make interesting puzzles for this area. Although some of the stars can be a bit too easy to get, I mean with fun then you just need to do a simple long jump and bam you got it. I think what really clicks for me in this area is that you can use Mario's skills to get through higher areas in this game, which I really like. Just do a triple jump here, do a wall jump there, and bam you're all the way up to the top. Overall, a pretty solid course, even though this area is inspired for a lot of internet ghost stories recently. 
And also, what the hell is that skybox? <laughs> Tall Tall Mountain is an area that exists in this game. There's an interesting secret pass you can go through to go through a slide area, but besides that, you're pretty much just climbing a mountain. And honestly, it does give you a bit of an adventure vibe, but even then, I feel like a gimmick here or there could work. But regardless, this is still a very solid one, there's just nothing very unique about this, besides climbing a mountain. Now, Tiny Huge Island, this is honestly a pretty cool course. But before we enter it, I gotta say, I really like how they introduce the paintings in these levels, because instead of one painting, you can actually access this area by two paintings. The main gimmick in this area is that there's this one island that you can swap between a small one and an extremely large one. The small one can be a bit weird because it's easy to slip and fall, but I honestly just really like the gimmick. There's just something really cool how when you affect something in the small area, it affects something in the big area, which is how you get to the Wiggler boss fight. With that being said, I honestly feel bad for Wiggler in this game, because you just flooded his home. This level also reintroduces Koopa the Quick from the first area of the game, where he wants a rematch, even though he's still really easy. But even then, even though he's easy, it is just really fun to get through the area as fast as you can, so I really don't mind it too much. Although this area where you need to get all the red coins can go to hell, I really hate this area, it gives me anxiety. Now those were all the areas for the second floor, but now it's time for the third and final floor where you have two final courses. TikTok Clock is one of the most recognizable courses in this area, where you're basically you're platforming through a giant clock. This is also the most platform heavy area in the game. And I'll be completely honest, earlier though I said I didn't mind how every star you get, you get booted out of the level. I cannot see the same thing for this area in particular, mostly because it feels like every time you get a star, you go back and you have to go back to the area you collected, only higher. Vids and repeat. And also, it gets a bit frustrating every time you fall off and you go all the way back to the bottom. But even then, I still have to give credit to theming because it's honestly really cool, where you can actually change how the platform moves depending on how the arrows are pointing when you enter the area. It's still a decent course, but not as good as the other ones. And last but not least, Rainbow Ride, and honestly this might be a big hot take. I honestly really like this course. Yeah, it's hell to go through the magic carpets, but honestly I really like how fast you can get through the area. Well, for the most part. When you start the area, you can just go in through this really slow carpet, or you can just go behind and do a really long jump and reach the pole area. Honestly, a really solid last level in the game. And honestly, overall, I feel like all the levels, even if they have certain ups and downs, they're all really fantastic, and I really like them. They're all memorable, very fun, and really well designed for the most part. And that's not even talking about the secret levels you can find through the game, like the hidden slide levels, the aquarium, and of course, the treacherous Bowser levels. And honestly, I really like how different they are. Unlike most levels in this game, where they're all exploration-based, these are the most linear levels in the game, and honestly, they feel very foreboding. Even though Bowser himself is a total cakewalk. I mean, literally, for the first two boss fights, you only need to attack him once and he goes down. It's not until the final level where he only takes three hits to go down instead of one. And also, I really like the music for the final level. It kind of weirdly makes me think of a, like, a Count Dracula theme for some reason. And I feel like it's probably a time to talk about the presentation of this game, because honestly, even though clearly it does not hold up really well, I feel like the aesthetics and everything has a certain charm to it. Like, everything is very bright, colorful, and it gives you a really nostalgic feeling to it. This game is also one of the first time where Charles Martinet get to voice Mario in a mainline game. I honestly felt a bit sad that he's leaving the role of Mario recently, but honestly good for him. He has voiced so many games over the years, he deserves a good retirement. And honestly, the new voice actor from Mario Wonder is doing a fantastic job, same with Luigi. So I just have to say a big thank you to Charles. Hope you have a great time in the next chapter of your career. Mostly because the performance for Charles was very nostalgic for me, even to this very day, especially like with the music. Which honestly, at first, I didn't really care for it too much, but as the more I listen to it, I just really love it. It just gives me a warm and fuzzy vibe to it. Whether it's the calm and chill save select music, or the very upbeat ba -bomb Battlefield theme, the soundtrack in Mario 64 is honestly very memorable, even if they reuse it a lot. And honestly, that's what I can describe Mario 64, it's just a really fun and memorable experience. However, this game is not going to be for everyone, because there is some aspects people might not get a good grasp of. Especially if this is not the version that they grew up with, because in 2004, 
there was a different kind of Mario 64 game. So after the success of the GBA, Nintendo worked on their next-gen portable console, which so happens to be the DS. As we all know, the DS is most famously known for having a dual-screen setup. And for the GBA games, they pretty much ported the entirety of Mario's 2D outings on that console. And with the DS main thing is that they can handle 3D graphics, why not just throw in Mario's big first ever 3D outing on that console? And voila, we have Super Mario 64 DS, a full-on remake of the original. So unlike the modern remakes we get nowadays where it's just a pitch-by-pitch -pitch remake, this remake does a lot more than just be a graphically enhanced remake. It adds a lot more of new content to it. You could tell that this is not going to be like the original Mario 64, as Yoshi, Wario, and Luigi are front and center of the box art. Which is honestly interesting when you think about it, because with the original, Luigi was famously scrapped from the game, which led to the famous L is Real theories. And of course, when you start the game, it starts off with the iconic Mario floating head, but this time, it's a good demonstration of the touchscreen. Instead of hilariously distorting Mario's face, you can actually distort this little drawing of Mario which demonstrates the touchscreen where you can actually draw your own stuff with it. Even Yoshi has a little intro for this title screen, which is honestly really nice. But anyway, so the intro pretty much exactly the same, Peach sends a letter to Mario that she made a cake for him, but this time, he brought Wario and Luigi with him. And this is when things become drastically different from the original, because as Mario, Luigi, and Wario goes into the castle, Yoshi's just sleeping on top of a roof like how you meet him in the original game. However, this time, Mario, Luigi, and Wario never came out, so Lakitu woke up Yoshi saying that there has been trouble with the Mario Brothers and Wario. So yeah, it's pretty much the same story of Mario 64, but with an interesting twist to it. Yoshi can control someone like Mario, he can still run, jump, do a long jump and such. However, Yoshi cannot wall jump or grab onto enemies, instead he uses his tongue to latch onto enemies and hold it in his mouth. It's somewhat like a grab, but you cannot grab big enemies like King bob or Bowser, for example. So instead, Yoshi needs to figure something else out to defeat King bob since he just can't grab onto him like Mario. I haven't played this game in years, but when I first saw this, that there are certain characters that you need to get a star with, I was a bit worried it would be Donkey Kong 64, but luckily they have an interesting way to play all the characters without backtracking all the way. So throughout the levels, you'll find these special caps from the other characters where, if you wear them, you'll transform into those characters. In one of the doors, it was pretty much just a small room, but instead it's a giant room with four different doors. With three of them having the characters in there locked behind doors that you need to find the keys for. Mario will be the first one you'll find after finding 8 stars, where Yoshi will be sent to a completely new and original level for this remake, where you'll be finding Goombas, a character that you can find in Paper Mario. One of the many rare examples of Paper Mario elements leaking to the other game series. So yeah, once you get Mario, he pretty much controls exactly like the original game. He retains his wing cap power-up, although for the other power-ups, this is when things become really different. So Mario only has two kinds of power-up this time. The first is the wing cap, and the other one where he turns into a balloon similar to Super Mario World. And the other two are locked behind two certain other characters. The first one with the invisible cap, that's locked behind Luigi, and the metal cap is locked behind Wario. Luigi, you unlock him by going through the Boo Haunted Mansion, where you can find a painting of him, which honestly, when I was young, I thought that was a really cool detail. And as for Wario, he can only be unlocked as Luigi, as he's the one that can grab the invisible power-up, and go through the mirror. Yes, you can go through the mirror in the remake, which is honestly really cool, and if you go through the door, it's just this weird white void. Luigi and Wario also have unique movesets, as for Luigi, he can do a flutter jump similar to Yoshi, but instead he uses it to slow down his fall. His backwards jump is also very broken, because he can glide through the area with this. He also has small trivial stuff on water because he can swim the fastest and can run somewhat underwater. However, he has certain drawbacks, for like, for one, he is the second weakest character in the game right behind Yoshi. And also, for some reason, he cannot wall jump like Mario. Only Mario can wall jump in this game for some reason. And last but not least, Wario. And honestly, he is probably the worst character to play as in this game. He's the slowest character to play as, and his jump height is pathetic compared to the other ones. However, to make up for this, he is the strongest character to play as, where he can destroy certain things that none of the other characters could. And because of the new characters and they have different traits, there are certain levels where only a certain amount of characters could go into. There was a secret level in Mario 64 where once you go underneath the moat, you could go through this level to get the invisible cap, but since you get the invisible cap on the fly now, 
This level is exclusive to Wario because he's the only one to punch the black bricks. Same with Luigi, he's the only one that can go through the Wario painting because he has the invisible cap. Not only that, but also certain courses in this game have been redesigned, like in Thwomp Fortress for example. They added a brand new path that goes all the way around the Thwomp Fortress, so if you fall off for example, you could recover. They also made certain levels a bit easier, like in Hazy Maze for example. There's a section where you need to go around the area and don't fall into the bottomless pits, but in the remake, they added a bit more paths to it so it's easier not to fall. Honestly, I feel like a lot of these changes are for the better. They even added a lot more stars to this game. Instead of 120 stars, there's 150 stars. With every course of this game having 8 stars instead of the usual 7. And for certain courses, they actually remove certain stars and replace them with something else. That star in Bubble on the Tile Field where you have to get on top of the floating island and you just get a star? That's been removed for this game and instead we have these brand new kinds of stars. Similar to the red coins, there's these collectible silver stars where if you get all 5 of them, you can get a star. However, unlike the red coins, if you get hit, you'll lose one of them and you need to get it back. There's even these special switch stars where if you hit it, there's a time limit and you need to get to the star as fast as you can before it goes away. Honestly, even though they have a lot of playable characters, it's honestly best just to use Yoshi throughout the game. Mostly because since he's able to use most of the caps in the game, he's able to use all the abilities plus his own. So essentially, you're able to use all the characters' abilities for certain stars, plus the unique abilities Yoshi can do, like spitting fire. And honestly, it's just pretty funny hearing Yoshi's voice out of Wario. A lot of this stuff really sounds cool, they even added a bunch of new minigames to showcase the DS. So throughout the game, you'll find these certain bunnies, like the ones you find in the basement, but instead they'll give you keys to unlock certain minigames. With the most recognizable one being Luigi in a Casino, and this is probably the closest thing I'll ever do with actual gambling. And also, Luigi looks really good in that tuxedo outfit. And the music is honestly really relaxing, I really like it. And graphically and aesthetically, this game looks way better than the original. I do feel like the N64 has better colors to it, I feel like for some reason the DS remake is a lot more washed out. And even the models for the characters are really good, um, the aliasing really does blend in like some of the imperfections of it, but honestly it works really well. It's honestly really cool seeing modern designs in the Mario 64 world. I mean, in the original, Bowser looked like this, and now he looks like this, and he's way more animated than he was in the X4. And also, it's really cool seeing characters that were only in Mario 64 getting an updated look. However, this is still Mario 64, and it still has the exact same level design and everything, so it has some of the trappings. Tiny Huge Island, for example, I honestly really like this course, but for the small area of the game, it's honestly a real hassle to get through. And at worst, they added new problems, like for example, they added Klepto from the Desert World in this game, where his main gimmick is that he'll steal Mario's hat. Doesn't sound too bad, but the problem is, is that if Mario loses his hat, he'll get double the damage. And Klepto is an enemy that moves a lot, which is a big problem when you have little to no leg room at a level like this. And honestly, at worst, I feel like Mario 64 DS plays worse than the original in levels like these. And I think it's time to talk about the big elephant in the room. This is the main complaint people have for the DS remake, which is that the controls in this game are not as good as the original. Because with Mario 64, it was made for an analog stick, but in this, you just have the D-pad. Now, for this game, I'm recording it off the Wii U Virtual Console, and with that, it has a similar D-pad to the DS, so I get a similar experience to it. And also, before I do so, it, I gotta say, it's kinda weird playing this game on a big screen TV. But yeah, with Mario 64 DS, you're controlling it with only 8 directions. And also, there's a run button, so you can actually move fast fast as Mario 64. And honestly, not just that, but also the control movement is different too, to compensate the D-pad. When Mario 64 was added thanks to the 3D All-Stars pack, they also gave you the ability to play it with a D-pad for some reason. And I can confirm that they changed the movement for this game entirely. The best way I can say it is that they made it so when the characters turn, they gave it the slight illusion that you're controlling with an analog stick. And it kind of works with certain levels like the bomb Battlefield for example, but when it gets to the tighter levels, you can really feel the difference between the controls. And honestly, even though I really love the additional content and playing as Yoshi for example, I would just prefer playing the original Mario 64. The main appeal of the game is just the fun movement and how much you can get through the areas as fast as you can for me. Super Mario 64 DS just feels a bit too slow for my taste. Honestly, I would like to see Nintendo take another crack at remaking Mario 64. 
I mean, it's Mario 64, it's probably one of the most influential games of all time, and out of every single Nintendo game, this one has to have the most longevity towards it. Whether it's the fun ROM hacks, speedruns, or random machinimas you have for Mario 64, this game just feels very timeless, even if it's not really perfect. I mean, no game is perfect. The community for Mario 64 is probably one of the strongest Nintendo communities for a single game, even more so for certain other series like Smash Bros. Melee, for example. And in 2020, I feel like Mario 64 got even more relevant than usual thanks to the various PC ports that released over the years. And over the years, people have been able to decompile the game and to make their own native port for Mario 64, which is honestly really impressive. And this led to various projects like Render 96, where it is a complete overhaul with the graphics. And honestly, I'm just really jaw-dropped by how much they were able to reimagine some of these levels graphically. I really want to try Render 96 one day, but the problem is, is that it's a bit too complicated to try to download it from what I've seen. But I have downloaded one Mario 64 remaster because of these PC ports. And honestly, I feel like this is the definitive way to play Mario 64. May I introduce you to Mario 64 Plus. So while this game isn't a graphically remastered game, it changes so much of the gameplay, and it's honestly a brand new experience to play through. For one, this game runs at a beautiful 60 FPS, which honestly, after all these years of playing Mario 64 and the DS in 30 FPS, the 60 FPS difference is honestly a huge difference. They added so much quality of life improvements to this game. Like for example, the thing that people complain about the original is that every time you get a star you get booted out, but in the remake you don't have to get booted out. I played through this game with that feature and honestly it's a really cool experience to play through this game without getting booted out. I didn't really mind this for most levels, but for TikTok Lock it is honestly a huge godsend. Now this game right here, Mario 64 Plus, is honestly the way to play Mario 64. It is just so much fun, it adds so much more quality of life improvements, and it's so much customizable. It's honestly just near perfection. And honestly, Mario 64 is gotta be one of my favorite games of all time, period. There may be a bit more objectively better games out there on the Nintendo Switch, for example, but honestly, I don't really care. I just love Mario 64. It's just so much fun, very replayable. I played this game as a kid years ago, and still to this very day, it still gives me a good smile on my face that no other game has. And it's a good example why I love the Mario series so much. And the best part is that Mario is just getting started, because after the movie, we're getting so much new Mario content now. It's honestly just so crazy how Mario is getting just better and better over the years. So whatever happens with Mario in the future, I cannot wait. But for now, I'm just going to appreciate the games we have over the years. But they'll do for today, so thank you for watching and I'll see you like Actually, how about we just do one more penguin toss just for the funs? <laughs> penguin go.